David was one to repent. Now he didn't always do it instantly when he did something wrong, but he was one that chose to repent and come clean before the Lord. The life of King David is one I think that every Christian should study in some form or fashion where you spend time going line by line or listening and joining in on a teaching just like this because of the life application lessons that we can learn from the life of King David. And David understood something about life. When you try to hide your sin, it almost makes you physically ill. And so one of the life applications that I personally have learned from King David is to repent, to come clean before God, as if we could lie to God and get away with it. That's foolish thinking. And so there are a lot of life applications that we can learn from David, both good and not so good. So we're gonna pick up once again. I'm gonna go back to chapter 15, where God gives King Saul, which was the first king of Israel, he gives him this command and told him exactly what to do. I want you to know something that's biblical and that we should all consider. And it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 29. I wanna read it to you. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 29 that, in verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. So when we go back and research the lives of the, the saints of old, the Old Testament believers, there are practical lessons, there are things that we can learn because this is what God wants us to know. There are some things that we won't know because they're secret, God says they are. And maybe one day in eternity, future, we'll see things, I uh, know we will, that will simply amaze us. But we're supposed to go back and research these things. The things that he's revealed, his word, we are called, I believe even commanded, to go back and do our research. So Saul is given a command in uh, the book of 1 Samuel chapter 15, and it says in verse one, it says this, Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. When God speaks, we should listen. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up out of Egypt. What he's hearing right now is something that happened long before his existence. This is having to do with the Exodus when the Israelites left Egypt. He said, the Amalekites did something really horrendous to my people, and I'm going to deal with them today. Through you, Saul, Samuel, I've sent to tell you what I want you to do. Now remember, the first command, if you don't keep the first command, you probably won't keep the second. So it's the first command to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then our neighbors as ourselves. You see, Following that first command, being in love with the Lord, that is our charge. And so, this relationship is supposed to carry Saul through his kingship. Then it says, Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Now, Saul hears this. And so, you know, it's kind of like, okay, I got it. But now the gravity of it is what's really important to understand that God had made a promise a long time ago before King Saul's life. God made a promise. It's found in the book of Exodus chapter 17. Yeah, get your Bibles out. God says something and something happened back then. And God made a statement in Exodus chapter 17 it says in verse 14, then the Lord said to Moses, this is long before King Saul, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because it will, I will completely blot out the name of Amalek or the Amalekites from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nisi. He said, because hands were lifted against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Because hands were, 
lifted against the Lord, he's going to be at war with Amalek from generation to generation. Maybe Saul knew this, maybe he didn't. But this was very important to God. I'm going to tell you another command that's important to the Lord that you may not think about every day. And that is love your neighbor as yourself. Now that seems like a simple one, but look at the relationships in your life and see, evaluate yourself, how you interact and work with people, loving them as best you can. Now you might say, where did you, how did you get there from here? Well, Saul was given this command to wipe out a nation. That's not your command. That's not mine. That was his. But ours is to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And when we really, really love them, we don't slander them. We don't backbite with them. We don't mistreat them. We do things with integrity before people. And when we make mistakes, which we do and we will, we acknowledge them. We move forward. If you don't keep the first command, you probably won't keep the second. So this was the charge that Saul gave them, that Saul gave, or Samuel gave to Saul. Now, the battle, if you read the previous verses in Exodus 17, Moses went up on top of a hill and he was going to oversee and intercede for Joshua as he was in battle. And as long as his hands were lifted, Joshua and the Israelite army, they were winning. And when his hands began to drift, then all of a sudden they started to lose. And so what happened was uh, the men, Aaron and Hur, they had to keep Moses' arms lifted so that Joshua and the Israelites would win the battle. That's the battle he's describing. And so now Moses is told to remember this, write it on a scroll, tell Joshua what happened, and now the promise that God made, it's time to be fulfilled through King Saul. What does Saul do? Now, in Ezekiel, because the charge to Saul, some people say right now, why is God so harsh? Why would he wipe out everybody? As if we're going to counsel God. Well, why did God want to wipe out all of them? You know, sin is not going to be around forever. It's not. It has to be addressed. It has to be dealt with. God is a just and holy God. So he has to deal justly and righteously. Otherwise, he's unjust and unrighteous. But God doesn't take pleasure in having to wipe out nations like we see in the book of Exodus. So I want you to read with me in the book of Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. Here's the word of the Lord. And I'm going to start reading in verse 10 of Ezekiel chapter 33. Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Sin can't just continue to mount up in your life. It will weigh you down. It says, say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God is saying, I take no delight in the death of the wicked. So that I say that to say to people who consider God being an unjust, unfair, unreasonable God who chooses one over the other. God doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. He continues, he says, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? God takes no delight in destroying people, the wicked. Sin, though, will not reign forever. What Satan did will not stand forever. What he did in the garden will not stand forever. And so sin has to be dealt with. That's what God is saying. And so when we say, is God unjust for destroying those people? No, God is just and God is righteous. Now, of course, Saul didn't obey the command and you know the story. And so now it's time to deal with the fact that Saul you were told to wipe them out and you didn't. Now watch how Saul 
responds. He tells Saul, Saul, I hear these sheep bleeding around here and you didn't do everything the Lord told you to do. Saul, you did a bad thing. This is not your first mistake. This is one of many that you've made and the Lord is going to deal with you. So it says in 1 Samuel 15, starting in verse 20, here is Saul speaking. But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. No, you didn't. And this is a very important life lesson. There's this point where we just come clean. I did it. I'm going to tell you, uh, I think it's quite liberating if you will get this is that you're gonna make mistakes in life. You're gonna fall short. And you're gonna do things that if you, when you look back, you're gonna wish you hadn't. So it's not really the mistake or the sin that's so bad, but it's bad. But how we respond to what we do is very important. Right in this moment, here's what Saul could have said, just like you and me. No, Samuel, you're right. I didn't. He gave every excuse. Well, the men were really starting to get upset. I wanted to, to reward them for their, their battle. No, you were told what to do. And here's what we, the lesson, the life application lesson that all of us should take from this. When we're wrong and our hearts even convict us, it's time to stop right there and address the situation first between you and yourself and then you and God and then maybe the individual but don't just do what Saul did listen I went on the mission the Lord assigned me yeah you did do that you left I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag their king well that was a mistake the soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder the best was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal now not only did he not do what he was told now he's giving a religious reason for to cover over what he did and people do it all the time I did go on the mission yes you did and you didn't do what you were told to do. You brought back some things that were supposed to be destroyed. Well, I'm going to give them to the Lord. I'm going to sacrifice them to God. In other words, I'm going to be religious about it. Then it says, but Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Now, that is key. When we gather to worship God, it needs to be in spirit and in truth. You see, just the act of worship, the, the lifting of the hands, the raising of our voices, that is not what God is looking for above all. He's looking for that right relationship with him. And Saul says, hey, we're getting ready to have church. So, I mean, what's the problem? Well, you didn't obey the Lord. You didn't obey God. Then it says, to obey is better than the lifting of the hands, than the singing of songs. To obey is better. That's for all of us. He says, better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance, like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, oh my goodness, the Lord has rejected you as king. Think about that. God reached his moment with Saul. That's a scary thing. That's scary to me. When God has, it's, it's up to here now. Oh, man. So the idea is this. Let's never get God to this point. It's a very, very um, powerful passage. You see, he compares 
disobedience or rebellion like witchcraft. Witchcraft is surrendering to another deity that's not God. Witchcraft is exalting um, some other form of, well, the devil, because there is no other God, over the Lord. That's what witchcraft is. You're counting on, calling on another power. And God says rebellion is like that. And then to do this, he compares it to idolatry. Something else in your life has been lifted before God. And it may even be yourself. You've made yourself an idol. And you see, Saul had all of these traits going on in his life. And God says, okay, I get it, Saul. You're not going to do what I told you to do. It's a scary place to be. And so when we look at this lesson, as it leads up to the life of King David, God was brought to his limit with Saul, and he's about to make a change. He's about to turn and do something different. And now, whenever God is moving, there are things that are happening in the background that we may not see. And so when God is moving, he's not without a plan or he's thinking as he goes. No, God knows exactly what he's doing, when he's doing it, why he's doing it and the outcome he's looking for. You see, even as you and I are doing what we're called to do, others are being prepared. And there is a change or a succession that will take place in life automatically. One person will rise and then move on and then another elevated. That's natural in life. But what's unnatural is when we are removed. And that's what was about to happen to Saul. So in 1 Samuel chapter 16, we'll move over. It says in verse 14 of 1 Samuel 16, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. What I read about this particular passage is that Saul began to deal with manic depression. He began to deal with uh, probably severe migraine headaches. This is where sin brought him. Sin had brought him to a point of um, becoming paranoid and all kinds of things going on in his life. And it says this evil spirit sent from God. Well, probably what that really means in some sense is that Saul had opened the door for demonic activity in his life. And these demons, because they had worked in him to cause him to be disobedient, he opened the door and they brought nothing but torment to this man. You don't mess around with the devil like that. And so Saul now is dealing with these things. It says Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Whatever they saw, it's like, Saul, this is... Maybe it was just their observation of the fact of what Samuel had said to Saul, and they saw Saul's decline. And after what Samuel had told him, they thought, God's punishing you, man. God is doing this to you. But whatever the case, Saul is going into deep states of depression, paranoia, uh, manic behavior. And so they says, you know what? We need to deal with this, Saul. You need to deal with this. Today we would say, go to the doctor and take a migraine uh, test and uh, whatever. The reality is what Saul had done had brought him to this place and it just might be that genuine repentance could have helped Saul. And maybe it could help you. Maybe it could help me. Just genuine repentance. God, I'm sorry. I, I, I did this. I said that. I did this. Maybe that's what's needed. Well, we in, in turn start taking all kinds of medications and doing all these different kinds of things. And maybe sometimes it's just a matter of making things right between you and God. And so it says, let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre, the musical instrument. 
He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is fine, a fine looking man and the Lord is with him. What's really happening right here, if we think about it, is that as Saul is diminishing, God is already in preparation of raising up someone else. Now, what we'll see about David is that this gift of his to worship the Lord, we never read about him going to, you know, uh, university where he's learning to play. In fact, we read about him being a shepherd. But maybe what he has is a gift from God. The ability to play those instruments and play them under such great anointing that the people that heard him said, that's, that's a gift from God. That kid's anointed. And you see, that anointing that David had, that gift was already in him. He didn't have to go and develop it. He had already been doing that. But that gift, what that really means is there's something about you already that God is doing in you and has done in you, an ability that you have, and you may have even figured out what it is and acknowledge it right now, that there's something about you that you know that's divine. There's something that God has done in you. And you see, the Bible says a man's gift will make room for him. David was operating in his gifting somewhere, probably very innocently, and some of the soldiers saw him and heard him and maybe even sat and listened. And they said, that is anointed music from the Lord. Now, what we'll find about David later is sometimes people are not going to like your anointing. Sometimes people are not going to like that. They're going to, in some instances, try to undermine the anointing that God has placed on you because maybe they don't have it. And so they don't like you having it. But if it's from God, you can't take it. It's from God. And so when we read Psalm 139, and I'll start reading in verse 13, it says this, the psalmist says, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. What he's describing is the reality that God shaped us. He knew us while he was forming us in our mother's womb. And in that process, he says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. In that process, God did something very unique in you and in me and in all of us. And what we're probably seeing in the life of King David is something that God prepared in advance for David, that he would one day call on it and he would use it for his glory. And I just think that's incredible. David wasn't planning as he's tending sheep on the other side of a mountain in obedience to his father. He wasn't planning to overthrow King Saul. He was just living his life, worshiping God and being trained by the Lord. Maybe not knowing for exactly what, but he accepted the training of the Lord. When God gave him the charge or when his father gave him the charge to watch over his sheep, watch over his sheep is what he, what he did. And whenever the sheep were attacked, David went after the attacker, a lion and a bear. And David learned faith. And he learned that God will watch over him as he's watching over those sheep because that is what he was charged to do. And when he was maybe at leisure sometimes or early in the morning, he would perhaps rise and play worship music before the Lord and prepare himself for the day. 
And so that anointing was in David. And David knew that it was from God. Just like you. God has done something in you. Why don't you find out what it is? Let me finish this verse. It says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I think that's just a beautiful passage. I think it's a beautiful revelation. People ask, where did we come from? Where were we before we were who we are? Remember, I read to you from Deuteronomy 29, there are some secret things that are just for God to know right now. But the things that he's made known, we're supposed to search them out and know them so that we might commit to them and obey them. So here we have David prepared for what God is about to do next. He wasn't plotting a revolt against Saul. He wasn't somehow trying to figure out how to undermine Saul's authority. He wasn't in some secret hidden place trying to come up with a way to trap the leader. No, that's not how David operated. That's not who he was. David was simply being who he was in Christ, really. And when the time came, when the bell rang, he answered. It was going to be a journey from here. It was going to be a journey for David. And he was going to experience some things. Whenever you take that step for the Lord, you're about to step into that next arena. It's not going to be without battle. Because you have to think of it this way. When you obey God, you're launching an assault against Satan. When you're walking in obedience, if Saul had been walking in obedience, he would have wiped out the nation that Satan used to attack the Israelites when they were coming from Egypt. Not only did they attack them, the weak and the elderly were lagging behind the rest of the group of people as they migrated through the desert. And they would come up behind them and wipe out their innocent, their elderly. God never forgot that. And he knew he was going to deal with it. And he told Moses to write it down. Remember, the things that are revealed, those are the things we're supposed to search out so that we might obey them in all of our lives. I'm going to use Saul to do this. So Saul's at the right place at the right time. But he made a drastic mistake. He didn't obey God. Not only that, he tried to cover it up and cover it over when what was required was repentance. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, here's what it says in verse 10. We are God's handiwork, his craftsmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. When God created you, when God created me, he did some very unique things in us. And he prepared them in advance for us to do them. The best thing you could ever do with your life is to align your life with the plan of God for you. Not the plan of God for me, the plan of God for you. You don't have to usurp anybody else's authority or try to take any position or do anything that's not for you. God has already prepared something and given you a gift and an ability that he gave uniquely to you for you to use at the time of his calling. David was ready or he was ready to be made ready, I should say. I don't know that he was ready for the battle that he was going to fight, just like I don't think you were, nor am I. We'll just fight it when we get there. Repentance is important. That's one of the things that we can learn from this text. Also, prepare yourself for what God has already prepared for you to do and to be. Prepare yourself. 
Because when the time comes, God wants you to be ready to use the talent, the gift, the ability that he gave you. When the time came for David, he was poised and in position to serve God according to the calling that was on his life. There's a lot to learn from the life of King David, and I hope you'll take something today and use it. Next week, we'll talk about when God opens a door. When God opens a door, when it's truly God, nobody can close it. When God opens a door. All right, God bless you.